Good morning, Emmanuel Church. How are you guys? Doing good? Woo! Um, well, good to see you guys this morning. Um, thank you for joining us. If you're new with us this morning, it's good to have you joining us for worship. Um, we're thankful you're here. Thank you for everyone who's watching online. We want to welcome you as well. Um, if you are new here, if you don't know me, my name is Brett Warner. I'm the pastor of Intercultural Ministries here, um, and I just want to welcome you this morning. All right, we have a lot going on in the life of our church in the next month or so. Um, if you've been here the last few weeks, you've probably already heard all this, but still listen. Um, there's a lot of ways that we get to engage with the community in the coming month, a lot of ways that we get to bless the people around us, a lot of ways that we can see the kingdom come through just simple serving. So um, first of all, we have Jubilee Day coming up this Thursday. Um, yeah, let's go. Um, so our church is going to be a parking spot for Jubilee Day. We'll be hosting people, greeting people um, for the big event. Raise your hand if you've been to Jubilee Day. A lot of you guys probably, I have not, but I've heard it's awesome and huge. So we need to come out here and welcome people. So um, there's opportunities to help with parking or greeting or hospitality, passing out water to the people who will be parking here. And we have a lot of slots um, to fill up. So John, would you stand up? John will be in the foyer after service, helping people get signed up, telling you where there are available spots to serve um, with whatever way we need serving. So find John if you're interested, um, and he'll help you get signed up. Thank you. Now, if you're wondering what this awesome display behind me is for, uh, we have VBS starting next Monday. Um, so it'll run the whole week. Twist and turns is the theme this year. If you have not signed your kids up, you should sign your kids up. This is going to be a great week. Um, it'll be a lot of fun, fun ways of learning about how to follow Jesus. And invite the community. Invite your friends and neighbors and coworkers who have children. Um, this will be a great way to encounter the Lord for our kids and have a great week. Um, and then at the end of the week, we have community fun night. So that's just a huge carnival um, that we'll be having here on our grounds. We invite the community. We have people come um, and just celebrate with us, have a great time, another way to engage in the community. But it's only fun if the community comes. So we want you guys to come. We want you to invite people, invite your friends, um, and we'll have a great time that night. Hey, Brett, I hear there's going to be a dunk tank. There is going to be a dunk tape. And you may have a chance to dunk me. Need, need That's I say incentive more. right there. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so come to Dunk James, um, if nothing else. Yeah. And if you want to volunteer for that, you can talk to Trisha, and she'll get you connected. Um, a few more things. Our baby bottle blasts. The baby bottles are due next week on Father's Day. So if you picked it up on Mother's Day, it's due on Father's Day. So make sure to bring it back next week if you haven't already. And then last thing. We have our English conversation clubs starting tomorrow. Um, so these will be on Monday nights throughout the summer. Someone asked me today, is this English classes 2.0? Kind of, yeah. Um, so we had a lot of students who were interested in continuing to practice their English um, and connect throughout the summer. So it's just an informal environment to come and help students practice English, people who are learning English. If you are interested and have a desire to step into relationship with people, our international community who God is sending to our town, this is a great first step. It's super informal. Just come and talk, ask questions, listen to people, um, and there'll be a sign up in the foyer or online. You can come one Monday. You can come every Monday, um, whatever you're available for. So, all right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to pass it over to James to lead us into worship. All right, we all stand with us as we come into a time of worship. Psalm 100 says this, Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His. His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. Let's worship him this morning. Searching for, we will 
no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Jesus the name here to just spend time in the presence of the Lord. Can we be honest before God this morning, church? As we approach Him in His throne this morning, can we be real with where we are at? 
can we sit comfortably in our brokenness? You know, it brings to mind this passage from Matthew 9 where Jesus, he's eating dinner with tax collectors and sinners and the Pharisees are complaining that he's doing this. Why would he eat with such sinners and filth? And I love Jesus' response because he says, it is not those who are well that need a doctor, but those who are sick. In other words, he's not talking physical there. He's talking spiritual. In other words, those that don't believe, that know that they're not righteous, that they're a mess, that they're broken, that without Jesus, they are nothing. (laughs) That's who he came for. Not those that think, I am great and I don't need him. And so I want us to just approach the throne this morning, sitting comfortable in our neediness for him sitting comfortable in our place of brokenness. And if you find yourselves needing to sit or kneel, Take a posture of surrender. Feel free to do so. You have that opening. Allow the walls, the walls of safety that are around you just to crumble, just to come down before him right now. Let your sense of desperation for him come to the forefront. If there's something that you need to let go of this morning, you're feeling a sense from him that he's telling you to let go of something, let it go. Place it at his feet right now. we sing this next song let this song be the prayer that's coming from your heart let this song be the truth that's coming from deep within and Lord I need you oh I need
temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. gospel never fails. We thank you that we have sung truth this morning, and truth from you is something that we can stand firm on. You do not change. You do not sway. You are never unfaithful. You are forever a God of love. And that love from you, Father, is so great that it reaches all corners of this earth and it reaches into every part of our hearts and our souls. We thank you, God, that when we were nothing, when we were in darkness, when we were in sin, you came as our rescuer, you came as our provider. And you gave us Jesus, who knows no sin, and is perfect. And Lord, when he was nailed to that cross, he took our sin onto himself. Yet three days later, he rose, and we serve a resurrected Jesus. We live in the truth and in the freedom that comes from you, Jesus. And we thank you this morning. Would you continue to remind us each moment and each day of that truth, that we live in a place of freedom and rest and dependency on you, and that you have more for us. You have depth for us to walk into in relationship with you, and you have breadth for us to step into in relationship with others, sharing the good news of the kingdom. So we pray, Lord, that this morning would be a moment of time, these couple of hours that we are here, that you take these truths and you anchor them in our hearts. And Lord, we also ask that your spirit would be at work, not just revealing these truths, but showing us, equipping us, leading us further into what it means to be gospel bearers, to speak this truth to other people. So come, Lord Jesus, fill this time as you are. We ask your blessing, your anointing, 
your words to come forth during the message in just a few minutes. And Lord, we are here, we are open, we are ready for what you have. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, and our Savior. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. And kids ages 5 through 5th grade can head to the back for Sunday school. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, worship team. Um, I am privileged to stand here with a honored guest, <laughs> uh, one of ours, actually. Um, and I'm not sure that many of you may not know who this is. So this is Jen O'Connor, uh, and I'm, she's going to introduce the rest of her family who isn't with, who are not with us right now. Um, so we're just going to start out with saying, who are you? <laughs> who are you, Jen? Uh, so that people can know. Well, you have a connection to our church here, um, not just through the missions of our church, but you have another connection to our church. So how about if you share who you are with us? Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Jen, my husband, Zach, and our son, Caleb. Um, our son, Caleb, is 10. Uh, my husband and I are both surgeons. Um, I'm sorry they're not here this morning. They're on the West Coast because of a death in the family. Um, but we're both surgeons. We're at Bongolo Hospital in Sub-Saharan Africa, a country called Gabon. Um, next slide has a picture of the hospital. Yeah. So this is, so our, this is part of our international partnership. Uh, international workers we partner with in Gabon, Africa. These guys are surgeons there. Should I call you doctor? Would that be better? <laughs> Dr. Jen. Um, but we're excited that you guys are they're back on home assignment for a few months. So the way they work their home assignment, they're gone for like nine and back for three. Is that how it works out, roughly? Um, sometimes six weeks. Um, okay. So, but we do come back uh, once a year. So we're always glad to have them when they come back and uh, see them here at our church. So... Uh, Wishing that Zach and Caleb could have been with us too, but understand the death in the family, they need to be out there. Um, so you guys are surgeons in this hospital in Gabon, Africa. Um, what do you do there? Tell us, tell us a little bit about that. So, um, well, let me, the uh, next slide um, shows a map of where we are. And um, at Bungalow, we're both surgeons, and we uh, run, we help with a... Um, it's a group that's across the continent that trains Christian doctors to become surgeons over the course of five years. So next slide, you'll see a picture of some of the surgery residents. So that's why we're there. That's what we're passionate about is training doctors to become surgeons, um, disciple them. Their families also moved to Bungalow. Um, so we have a chance to feed into them. And a, a number of them are from other countries countries that people in the Alliance have a hard time getting to um, for cultural reasons, countries that have other religions. And so then these guys can go back to their home countries as Christian surgeons and be a light in their country. So we're passionate about that. And we're passionate because in Gabon, 25% of the population is from other West and North African countries. It has a very large immigrant population. And so... Because of different cultures, people stay within their people group. So there's not a lot of interaction with Gabonese who might be Christians. And some of these immigrants would never walk into a church. But if they're sick, they'll come to the hospital. And so it gives us a chance to respectfully provide gospel access to people from other parts of Africa who come to Bongo Hospital. Jen, that is so beautiful. Um, both you and Zach could easily be here working in the United States, working in some hospital here, um, but yet you chose and are choosing on a constant basis to, to be in Africa, to be sharing the good news of Jesus through surgery, through opportunities where people need assistance, but also through training. Uh, and it's a bigger than just the people that come to you. It's that training and that outreach, which is just really cool, uh, that partnering the, to, to send out people too 
even on the mission field. A lot of time we think of sending people to a mission field, but you guys on your mission field are actually sending people out of that mission field, out into around Africa, other parts of Africa, and that's just so cool. So Jen is going to be speaking with us tonight, give us a lot more information about what's going on. You never did tell us your connection back here, by the way. Oh, um, so my parents, Gordon and Cindy, they're here, and... Um, We've been in Bangalore for over 10 years, and we're grateful that from almost the beginning, Emmanuel kind of adopted us, if you will, as their IWs, and our son as um, one of their missionary kids. So we're just really thankful um, to have that partnership. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so, so Jen is going to be back tonight. She's going to give a, a whole lot more time to speak, give you time to, time to speak this evening about what they do, what their ministry looks like. Uh, it's really going to be cool. But... Can you give us like just a little snippet, maybe an idea of what we might hear about tonight? So if you're available, we'd love to see you tonight. If you come, you might hear a story um, about how a number of things connect a professor of the Quran, the father of John the Baptist, and a surgical problem, and how there might be a story about how, how all that is connected. <laughs> I don't see how that could all connect, but I'm, that sounds really cool. So, Jen, thank you very much. We're excited about that. So, come out this evening, um, 7 o'clock tonight, to come hear more about that story uh, and to hear more about the ministry that Jen and Zach are doing. So, we're excited about that. Thank you, Jen. At this time, I have a privilege of introducing uh, David Dixon, who's going to bring the word to us this morning. Uh, David works at our district office, if you understand the alliance and how we're set up of churches, and our churches are broken into districts. Eastern PA District is, one of, is a district we're in, and David works in uh, Eastern PA District. David has served in multiple churches and plant, planted a church in Iron Mill Church up in Danville area. Um, now works as the executive director of our Eastern PA District. Him and I actually worked together for about a year and a half. Uh, we overlapped while I was in the district office. Um, let me just tell you a couple things about David uh, before he comes up to speak. David's an amazing systems guy. He loves figuring things out, and he's a, and organizing things. He's amazing at that. Um, does a great job for a district in that. But that's not what's the best. What's higher than that is David loves Jesus. David loves the church. He also loves to see people transformed by the gospel. And David loves to see the kingdom of God expand. When I think of David, I think of those things. This is who he is. This is why he functions the way he does. Uh, it's part of what I love about him. So this is what he brings to the table to this morning for us is his passion for Jesus and who he is. So David, uh, whatever God has laid on your heart for us this morning, we look forward to hearing from you today. Thanks for being with us this morning. Thank you very much, Dwayne. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that very, very kind introduction. I hope that uh, the sermon lives up to that. Uh, it was pretty lofty there, so... Uh, it's good to be with you, Emmanuel family. Uh, I just want to send some greetings from our district team. Uh, as many, I know many of you have been praying for Nate Howard, our DS, as he's been recovering from back surgery, uh, and he continues in that recover, recovery ever so, so slowly. Uh, but thank you, Emmanuel, for being a church that cares about the kingdom of God, both here and around the world. Uh, and so we are very grateful uh, that Emmanuel is a part of our district. Uh, so even though maybe we're not here as much as we'd like to be, please know that you are on our hearts. We pray for you often uh, and that we are very, very grateful for your partnership in the gospel uh, through the Alliance. Uh, one thing Dwayne didn't mention uh, about me and my family uh, is that we have five kids all right, we have five kids that range all the way from 13 uh, down to one. Uh, yeah, there was an audible sigh there. All right, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's our life right now. Uh, we're worth where we're at. But, you know, it's funny because five kids really is considered large by today's standards. Uh, I recognize past generations that wasn't necessarily the case where you had, you know, a 10, 11, 12 kids sometimes in a family. But by today's standards, five uh, is quite a bit. 
Uh, but one thing my wife and I discovered is that there's actually a line, there's actually a number of kids that you have from going kind of more culturally acceptable to being that crazy, crazy family, right? Sometimes I think people think that we're Amish, all right? Clearly we're not, all right? But there's a line, and that line is actually when you go from three to four kids. I, I don't know why, but that's the line, from three to four kids. So here's some of the comments that we have received, either I've received or my wife has received as we've gone out uh, with, with our five kids in public. Uh, the one that my wife gets is when they hear that we have five kids, they look at her and they go, why? <laughs> why? I don't know. Uh, the other one that, that we get is, how do you afford them all? And I'm still trying to figure out the answer to that question, but I'll let you know. Uh, the other one we get is, what kind of car do you have? Again, because I think they automatically assume we must have one of those large white vans. Uh, is the, I, I don't know. Um, but my, my, my favorite one, and this one is, sometimes gets a little awkward, is sometimes people will lean in and they'll go, do you, do you know what causes that? <laughs> and on a couple of occasions, we've wanted to say, no, could you tell us? And make it really, really awkward for them. But... One of the things we're discovering is that in our culture today, because it's not necessarily quote-unquote normal to have uh, that many kids, is that there's a lot of different things in our culture that aren't necessarily designed these days for having larger families. Uh, and I joke, I joke with people that, you know, when I, in my role, I work with church plants and church planters, and so we're always talking about multiplication and planting new churches and making new disciples. And so I joke that, you know, if I'm doing that for my work, I just need to back it up by how I live as well. Uh, but there's a reality there for us, and this is where I want to draw our attention to in the book of, or in Psalm 127 this morning, uh, is that, and I wanna, this is where I want to kind of draw our hearts and attention to, it's that as human beings, we were made to live content with God and to multiply our lives into the lives of others. That we were made to live content with God and to multiply our lives into the lives of others. Now, when I talk about multiplication there, I am not strictly talking about uh, biological children. Right? That's one way that we can multiply, uh, but there's many different ways that we can go about that. But what, I, what I'm talking about is, is that we were made to pass on what the Lord has entrusted to us to others who will then go and entrust it to other people around them. That as we live our lives, we're to live in such a way that we're content with what God has given to us in his son Jesus in such a way that we orient our lives not for ourselves, but so that the gospel works in us and through us into the lives of others so that in them, their lives are changed by Jesus and they pass on what has been entrusted to them. So as we look at Psalm 127 together this morning, I want us to see how the psalmist emphasizes this reality and calls us to live in dependence and purpose in him. So this is Psalm 127. The word of God says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate." Now, you'll notice the psalmist, and if you're, depending on your translation of the Bible, uh, it might say a psalm of Solomon above it. Uh, some do, some don't. And there's a little bit of a, a debate as to whether or not this was actually written by Solomon or it was written for Solomon. Uh, but regardless, you can actually pick up on kind of the Solomon themes, or if you were to track with Ecclesiastes and other books, this idea of what's worth 
giving your life to, right? In Ecclesiastes, it talks about the vainness of life, right? And in this, uh, you can see it starts out with these, these couple phrases related to uh, vainness or what's worth giving your life to. And it starts off with, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And so we're introduced right away to two kind of, two kind of people or roles or things that people are doing, and that's building and watching. But you'll notice that in the context of the psalm, the builder and the watchman, their work is for not unless it's the Lord that builds it, unless it's the Lord that watches over it. Now, there's a couple things uh, kind of practically that we can begin to pick up for this, pick up from this. First is that according to the Lord, there's some things that are worth building and worth protecting. Right? We can also see that there's a, there, there, there can be this, this kind of uh, rubbing with what maybe we think is worth building and what God thinks is worth building, right? There, or this idea that if we go about per, pursuing what we desire to build or what we desire to protect for ourselves, that that may not be the things that the Lord desires to build or that the Lord desires to protect which I think is why we see in verse two that it begins, to, it's vain that you rise up early and go to late rest because there's a sense of, depending on what we're aiming for, depending on what we're, we're, what we're going after, if we're going after the wrong things or we're protecting the wrong things, then out of that, what begins to happen is, is there's a sense of we have to do it on our own. Or even deeper than that, we begin to see in later in the passage that it says, that they would eat the bread of anxious toil. There's a sense of that, that all that work is in vain, which means it's kind of, it's meaningless. So one of the things I want to draw out in this for us this morning is that as followers of Jesus, that we are to live content in the person and purposes of God. You see, that builder and that watchman they have to be content knowing that when they go out to build and when they go out to watch, that they have to be content that the Lord is at work. They have to be content that what they're giving themselves to in him is worth it. Because otherwise, it's in vain. And so this goes beyond just a simple, like, I build it and then I hope and pray and pray and pray that God will somehow bless it. There's something that happens there where the builder and the watchman must align themselves, not just externally, but internally, with who God is and what he's doing in such a way that we're building the things, we're, beginning, we're working towards building the things that the Lord desires to build, and we're working to protect or to watch over or to care for the things that the Lord says are worth uh, protecting or caring over. And so when we think about this, and again, in terms of homes or churches or communities, what we're beginning to get at here is this idea of contentment in him. That in the Lord and all that he has given to us in Jesus Christ, his, his love, his peace, his, the sacrifice of his son Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, the promise uh, that we will be raised to life with him, the relationship that we have with him now uh, that, again, will last forever in that daily and you know, regular patterns of life as we go about building our lives and caring for the daily things, are we content with who God is and how he's working in our lives? Are we content, are we, or another way I might say that is, is are we good with how he's working and how he's providing and how he's caring for us in the ways of life? Or are we struggling against that, struggling against him to build for ourselves our own kind of house or our own kind of kingdom 
Because, again, as the psalmist indicates, that's, that's where the rub is. That's where the result of that is the restlessness and the anxious toil. Because as I think about that in my own life, that's what I would describe as kind of the opposite of contentment. It'd be a feeling of restlessness, like, like something's always not quite good. Or maybe a sense of anxiousness in the sense of, I've got to, do, I've got to work harder. I've got to work faster. I've got to be able to do more. Those would be signs of a lack of contentment. Those would be signs of perhaps we're building our own kind of house or we're seeking to protect the wrong kinds of things. As I think about this in my own life, one, uh, one story that pops to mind is when we were preparing to plant uh, what is now Iron Mill Church in Danville, uh, Melissa, and my wife and I, we were really praying about whether or not this is what God really wanted us to do. Uh, you know, I, I've kind of heard about church planting at that point. I, we had talked about some of these things, but it's a little bit different when you start to like go and, and, and think about doing it. You know, things start to get real, you know, in terms of like, we got to move, we got to move all the whole family, all these things. And so uh, I did what, what I normally like to do is I did a lot of research. I like to talk to people, find out what's going on. And so we went and visited with one of our friends who was planting a church uh, who had, or had just planted a church in Middletown, Delaware. And so we sat down with them to talk about, you know, kind of their church planning experience and what that was like, how hard it was, and all those things. And I remember, uh, I remember uh, him and his wife kind of looking at Melissa and, I, and during the conversation, and he says, when you step into church planting, you're going to have to be prepared that everything in your life is going to be open to God. And that whether the church plant succeeds or fails, you're going to have to be okay with God in that. And what he was really kind of getting at with us was that regardless of how this goes, are you going to be content with God? Are you going to be good with him? And uh, that question apparently wasn't enough to scare us to stop us from church planting, uh, but it's one that stuck with us, and it's one that stuck with me in my journey and walk with God. As I step forward in caring for my family, as I think about my own personal walk with God, as I think about how I lead our family, I, as I think about how uh, I lead uh, in the areas that I'm responsible for in our district, Am I leading them from a place of contentment in who God is and what he's done through Jesus and in the purposes that he has for me to be a multiplier into the world around me? Am I okay giving my life to those things as he has called me to? And I think that's a question for us as we wrestle with it. And so the reader, or I'm sorry, the writer of this psalm is leading us to ask, do I trust the Lord to be the builder or to be the watchman of my life? And there's a few things for us to consider in there as you think about your own life. Sometimes it's maybe hard to say I'm content with this, but often the signs of a lack of contentment are very obvious. We've mentioned some of them. Anxious toil. That sense of, I just got to keep trying harder and harder. If you sense that in your life, that's probably an indicator that something is not quite right in that area of contentment. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a sense of, uh, do, I, do I know my purpose? When I, 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 generally speaking, in my life, do I know what it is that God has called me to? Or do I have a sense of restlessness where it doesn't matter even if a day goes really well, there's something in me that's not quite right with God. Those would be signs of a lack of contentment. Those would be things that would lead us to say, God, show me, lead me where I'm not in contentment with you. And then out of that, what we begin to do is begin to walk towards God and to ask him for help in those areas of our lives, to ask him to show us what is standing between us and him 
in those particular parts or areas of our lives. As I think about contentment, uh, the Puritan pastor, Jeremiah Burroughs, who wrote uh, what is a a fascinating uh, view into the Puritan idea of contentment. Uh, it's, It's a book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. He wrote this. He said, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. This contentment does not come so much from outward arguments or help as from the disposition of their own hearts. And as I think about that for us as followers of Jesus, Jesus came, lived, died, and rose again so that we can be reconnected with God the Father, so that we could find contentment, that we could find wholeness in him, and we could find purpose for our lives so that we would build houses that are worth building, and that the Lord would build. And we would we'd watch over city homes and churches and cities that we would join the Lord with in watching and caring for because we are content in him and the purposes that he has for us. You'll notice that the psalmist goes on in verses 3, 4, and 5, and he begins to talk about not just the contentment in the person, but I want to focus in on that purpose part of it as well. You'll notice the psalmist says, uh, beginning in verse 3, he says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children's of one, one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. And so I want to suggest to you this morning that when we find contentment in who Jesus is, the purpose of our lives and the contentment which, the purpose with which we'll find contentment, again, the house that's worth building, the, the city that's worth watching, is when we give ourselves to seeing the gospel go out into future generations. That is the contented purpose that our Lord has for us. So as the psalmist highlights, what's the house worth building? What's the city worth protecting? It's a house where the next generation is welcomed and flourishes in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I recognize that this psalm does this specifically in the context of family. It does so, it talks about children and and quiver and those things. But when we see this this theme in the, the fullness of the scriptures, we find that this theme was not just in one psalm or here and there, that this idea that our purpose as human beings was to walk with God and to be, to be multipliers or to be people that pour into the lives of others around us is a theme throughout all of Scripture. We see that in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, the mandate to Adam and Eve. He says to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth and subdue it, right? That's not just have a lot of kids, right? It's have a lot of kids and, and establish Right? Establish families and families of families and communities and, and, and cities and towns that would give honor and glory to God. Of course, we know that in Genesis 3, right, that got severely off track. And so what began to multiply in the world was sin and brokenness. But God didn't give up there. In Genesis 12, he steps in into the family of Abraham and he tells Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, he says, I'm going to be a blessing to you so that you would go and be a blessing to others. Again, it's this idea that when God works in someone's life, it doesn't stop there. It's that they multiply that into the lives of others, right? That we're blessed by God through what Jesus has done so we can pass it on to other people. That's part of what it means to walk with him. But it doesn't even stop there. It goes on throughout the covenants of the Old Testament, but we see it again when Jesus is here on this earth and he walks this earth And he does something crazy. Instead of just like traveling the world, preaching to large crowds, getting people to follow him, he grabs 12 rather ordinary people and he pours his life into them and he tells them to go and to do the same. 
And so there's a big connection between be fruitful and multiply in Genesis. And then in Matthew 28, when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, right? It's, it's the same general command. Go and multiply what I have given to you into the lives of others. Pour yourself out so that the next generations, the people around us, the next waves of believers and disciples would come to know Jesus. That is the purpose of a Christian who is contented with Jesus. Now again, this rubs very differently than how our culture would tell us to live in these days. This rubs against even how a lot of our culture is designed and set up. Because see, here's the thing. Investing your lives into the lives of others is not a super glamorous act. Right, you know, uh, you know, if you've worked with, with kids or students, right, you know this all too well. Right, if, you, if you've coached, you know, coached, you know, teams and tried to love on, on students that way, or if you've tried to, to disciple and witness to some of your coworkers, right, you know that this isn't necessarily a glamorous work. But are we content in Jesus to do it? Right, see, the world would have us say, build a house with your name on it. Build a house that's for your own glory. Build a house that you can protect. But unless the Lord builds the house, the builder builds in vain. Unless the watchman, or unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman watches in vain. Are we content in who Jesus is and the purpose that he is that he's given to us? See, pouring our lives into the lives of others doesn't necessarily come with monetary rewards. If you give yourself to that, you will most likely, not always, but most likely, you will not be rich and famous. You will most likely not make a significant name for yourselves your legacy will not be etched, right, in the annals of history. They will most likely, again, not always, but most likely be forgotten. But your legacy, your eternal legacy, will be the generations. It'll be the sons and daughters. It'll be the friends and coworkers. It'll be the, those in the community that perhaps are not like us that we connect with, that we pour ourselves into so that they would know Jesus and that they would walk with him. And that as they go and they do the same thing for generation and generation and generation, all of those names will be written where it is most important that names will be written in the book of life. And so while we might not gain the stature that our world so greatly clamors for in these days, we will gain the stature that is worth having when our name goes unknown, but generation after generation after generation is touched because we were willing to do it the way that Jesus called us to and to pour ourselves into the lives of others. That is why, or that is what the psalmist is calling us to. You'll notice the last, last part of verse five. It says, he shall not, again, talking about the, uh, the, uh, the man with uh, a full quiver, he shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. Now, we don't have a, a context for this idea of at the gate, but in those days, business was done at the city gate. So if you were inside or outside the city or in the surrounding kind of like farmlands, if you had business to do, you came to do the city gate, whether that was a change of property or any of those kinds of things. And so when this, per this, this man who had a, a, a family, uh, a larger family, would come to the gate, even his enemies would say, oh, this is a, this is a blessed man. 
This is a this is must be a, a righteous man, right? And that was a lot of how uh, the Old Testament uh, is 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 viewed. Um, but in our day and age, while we don't have a context for that, I think it, it'd be of the of the same way that when we see someone who pours their lives into others in such a way that there's something so honorable, so moving about someone who pours their life out in that way that we can't help but say, that is an honorable man. That is a blessed man. That is an honorable woman. That is a blessed woman. Why? Because they gave them the, of themselves. They were content not to have the things of this world, not to have the status of this world, but to pour themselves into the lives of others in such a way that it multiplied for generations. And we get to see that one little sliver of it. And in that way, we'd say that they are blessed, that there's no shame on their life because they are blessed and honorable and have given themselves to what is right before God and the purpose that God has called them to. So as we think about this in our own lives and we wrap this morning, I want, I want you to kind of think about your own life for a moment. First, do you have any sense of a lack of contentment with God? That could be over a particular life situation. Perhaps it's something more internal. You could even perhaps struggle with a sense of restlessness around what people think about you. Right? I know many of people who clamor for status, or maybe not significant status, but at least enough of a status that people would say they, they're known. But in that, it does, is Jesus knowing us enough? Right? When we think about our life situation and all that God has brought to us, are we good with the path that God has put us on? Are we okay if we give ourselves to the purposes that God has for us? So if you have any of that sense of restlessness, first, I, I would start by, by and, and kind of admitting that in some way. Because that's not always an easy step. It's not always an easy step to say, I, I'm not content with God. Because especially in Christian circles, right, if you've been a Christian for a long time, we tend to move towards, well, I've been a Christian for a while. Everything should be really good. Everything should kind of look a certain way or kind of have a certain, uh, uh, you know, kind of feel to it. But sometimes inside of us, there's these things that we need to, to work out or to wrestle out with God. The second is, is if you have that, is it because of, if it, is it because of something that you're struggling with God or is it because the house that you're trying to build is not the house that God desires for you to build. Again, is, does the house have your name on it or the Lord's name on it? Is it worth protecting because the Lord says it's protecting or is it worth protecting because you say that it's worth protecting? Are we giving ourselves to the purpose that God has given to us to multiply our lives into the lives of others. One last piece here. When I think about this for myself, um, my mind goes right away to Jesus. When I think of all the things that Jesus could have done with his life, the 33 years that he had on this earth, I mean, he could have like, you know, traveled all over, brought many people to come to know him, right? He could have gone as far, he could have gone all the way to the east, he could have gone all the way through Europe, but for the most part, he stayed in this really small part of the world. And instead of preaching to crowds over and over again, he actually walked away from a lot of them. Not all, but some. And he spent most of his time with 12 ordinary people, Right? And when God came, when God, you know, in, in as, as God the Father and God the Son were working out what the redemptive plan was going to look like, and they, they decided that someone was going to have to die for the forgiveness of the sins of the world, Jesus says, I, I, I'm content to be in that role. I'm content 
to serve God the Father in that way. I'm content to love my creation in that way. My mind goes to Philippians chapter 2, where it says that Jesus became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Why? Because he was content with his relationship with God the Father. He was content with the purpose of his coming and dying and rising again. He was content with that and willing to do it, knowing that the purpose that he had was to die for us so that we might receive the blessing of knowing and living content with him and multiplying the good news of Jesus into the lives of those around us. So as human beings, we were meant to live content with God and to multiply our lives into the lives of others. And that the good news of Jesus that has been entrusted to us, we are here to pass it on to the next generations. Are we good with that? And are we good with him and the purposes that he has for us? I'm going to invite the the worship team to come on back to the stage. And what I would like for you to do as you, uh, again, we have these last few minutes together, um, is for you to have a conversation with God. We know that as followers of Jesus, uh, that we have this wonderful gift in the Holy Spirit that speaks to us, that helps us, that empowers us. And so my hope is, is that as we've worshiped together this morning, as we've opened the Word of God together this morning, as we've interacted together this morning, that the Holy Spirit's been speaking something into your heart and into your life. Perhaps it's a specific area of your life where you're seeking to build your own house. Perhaps it's a friend or coworker that God is saying, this is who I want you to to pour your life into. Perhaps it's a specific call to ministry, whether that's to serve a particular area in this community or perhaps even to go and serve the Lord uh, with some of our alliance work overseas. But I know this, that for each and every person in this room, the Lord's desire is that you would be content in living and walking with him and that you would live out the God-given purpose that he has for you to multiply it, multiply the gospel into the lives of others. So what I'm gonna invite us to do is for you just to take a few moments. And if any of those things come to mind for you, that I'd invite you to, to, to talk with God about that. If it's in that realm of you've been you know, doing your own thing, or maybe even it's Jesus plus a little bit of your own thing, whatever that own thing is that you've been seeking to build or watch over, then I would confess that to God. Say, God, here's this part of my life that I've been holding on to or that I've been seeking to protect or, or keep from you and to talk with him about that. Perhaps you have a sense this morning when we talk about multiplying into the lives of others. Again, maybe God's putting specific people or groups or a calling into your heart this morning. Then I would lean in and say, God, is this what you're calling me to? And my hope and prayer is you would hear the words of the Holy Spirit say yes. And so we're going to take a few moments just to interact with God in this way. And so if you uh, feel comfortable doing that in your seat, go ahead and do that. If you want to kneel before God, feel free just to turn in your space and do it. If you would want to come and kneel up here on the front row, if there's someone that the Holy Spirit is leading you to go to in this room and to pray over this morning, then go to that person. Don't let what other people are are looking or anywhere in this space, don't let that stop you. If you're here this morning and you say, "I, I know God's saying something, but I'm having a really hard time discerning what it is, then I invite you to uh, either to, to come forward or to see myself or one of the elders, and we'd be happy to pray with you 
and just pray over you and ask for the clarity and discernment of the Lord to be on you. But let's take a few moments and let's just respond to what the Lord would have for us. And may the courage and wisdom and the sweet peace of contentment of our Lord Jesus move in our midst this morning. sense from the Lord that uh, he'd like me to pray a blessing over Emmanuel uh, as a church, and so would you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, you love this church. You love your church. And so, Lord, in your name, I pronounce a blessing of peace and contentment over my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, that in these days where there is restlessness in our culture, there is anxiety in many, many people, that it would be said of this body of believers that they are content in the Lord Jesus Christ that they are good in trusting in your sovereignty and in your sufficiency for every area of their life. And Lord, that where they struggle, you would encourage them and that you would strengthen them. And so Lord, I also pray a blessing over them of multiplication. Lord, that they would not be uh, okay with just coming and going to services. But Lord, that you would put a fire in their hearts and a desire in them to pour themselves out into the lives of others. That as the gospel, as your good news, Lord, has impacted them, that it would impact this community the variety of people groups that make up this area. Lord, and that they would have the courage to step forward and to make new disciples and to raise up new leaders and to plant new churches and that they would be willing to give themselves towards that for your honor and for your glory, Lord. And as they do, Lord, may your blessing fall upon them in powerful, unique, in mind-boggling ways. And so I pray this over and for Emmanuel Church. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you.
we are desperate for you. Lord, we are desperate for you to build the house, build our individual houses, build this house together. And unless you build it, we labor in vain. So God, we need you. We thank you, Lord, that you are enough. As we talked about the other day, you are a good shepherd. In you, we lack nothing. You provide everything we need for life and godliness. So God, right now we confess our need for you and we receive the contentedness that you provide by your spirit and through Christ. Lord, would you make us content in you, make us satisfied in you, in the areas that we are not yet satisfied in you, not yet content. Lord, this week and the weeks to come, would you align us more with you in that and in contentedness. Lord, you are more than enough for us and in you our cup runs over. God, help us to receive from you. Help us to grow in receiving from you, receiving your love, receiving your empowerment, receiving your satisfaction so that we can be a blessing to the nations around us so that we can bless everyone and live on mission with you as you desire. We cannot give from an empty cup. So Lord, fill our cup with contentedness, with with the fullness of God that you provide. We thank you, Lord, that in you, all your promises are yes and amen. That you will give us what we need. Help us to walk that out. This week, help us to live that out, to, to become more content in you to stop building our own houses and let you build our house. We surrender to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, thank you guys for worshiping with us this week. If you want to stick around and keep dealing with things with the Lord, um, you're welcome to come up front, stay where you're at, but at this point, Emmanuel, you are dismissed.